Hello, my friend, and welcome to Something For Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashbitz, and today is a solo episode of the podcast, and it's all about anxiety, specifically seven simple ways that we can reduce our anxiety. And before we jump right into those habits, I really encourage you to refer to episodes 218 and 220 of the podcast because they go deep into target setting, goals, purpose, who you really are, your core values. And then episode 220 is all about installing and deleting habits. It's really a masterclass on behavior change. So I encourage you to go check out those because those are going to allow you to have the foundation and the fundamentals to really implement and take action on these anxiety reducing tools. And it's going to further allow you to build your mental fitness toolkit, which is what you really need to become the best version of yourself in greatest service of the world. So again, 218, 220, go listen, go watch, and then come back to this episode and then install these anxiety reducing habits and tools to start building this mental fitness toolkit so that you can handle anything that life throws at you and you have this mantra of obstacles make me stronger. And so let's jump right into these seven simple ways. But before that, let's let's define our terms. Everyone really knows what anxiety is. It's very common, but anxiety is a feeling of worry, nervousness or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. A mental condition characterized by excessive apprehensiveness about real or perceived threats, typically leading to avoidance behaviors and often to physical symptoms such as increased heart rate and muscle tension. An important part of that definition is understanding that there is physical symptoms, physical symptoms that come with anxiety which means our mind and our body are interconnected and bidirectional and we have to treat them as these interconnected beings and parts of ourselves. And so what's really important is realizing that and understanding that we have to create this sort of embodied techniques and embodied habits that allow us to get connected with our brain and our body and who we really are. And it's really all about this Dr. Michael Gervais insight, with which is Um, having a love affair, having a love affair with the present moment. I think that's really powerful and really important and an important part of dealing with anxiety, overwhelm, stress, things of that nature. So let's go on to number one, which is breathing exercises in combination with meditation. So breathing exercises and meditation, I lump these two together because sort of one leads to the next. They're not the same thing. Breathing exercises are a standalone technique. Meditation is a standalone technique, but I I put them together because I think they have a lot of powerful tools that we can combine or really you can pick and choose which one works better for you. Is it breathing exercises? Is it meditation? Is it the combination of both? How really get, how connected can we really get to our breath, which is our life force, our anchor, our best friend? Because you will take about 650 million breaths in your lifetime. And so we might as well start taking optimal and intentional ones and making them count. Because you know, seriously, five minutes of intentional breathing can completely shift your day, your mental state, how you feel. And it starts with a a breathing practice that's too small to fail. So let's start with saying to ourselves, I'm going to take one mindful, intentional and optimal breath per day or per week. That's too small to fail. Then we incrementally move up from there. And we can all com- we can also make it an algorithm in our life. An algorithm means if this, then what? If this, then what? If I go to the bathroom, then I take a mindful breath. If I walk through the door, then I take a mindful breath. We can start adding these pieces into our life so we can become more present. We can gain this love affair with the present moment through breathing, through our breath, through our life forth life forth to our our life force, right? That's really what we're trying to get here. And we always want to breathe into our nose, into our belly and out through our mouth. That's really, really important. And there's a bunch of different methods you can do box breathing, which is four in four hold four uh, out and four hold, or you can do four, seven, eight breathing, which is similar, but it's four inhale, seven hold eight exhale. You really just need to find what works for you. 
You really just need to find what works for you. And that's about trying things and then developing that mental fitness toolkit so you can um, enhance the practices you have now in the journey to become that best version of you in greatest service of the world. And now in conjunction with that, we could have a meditation practice. And a meditation practice is is one of the most powerful tools for reducing anxiety, simply why we're, we're talking about it today, but it's for those chronic overthinkers, people who feel a little bit overwhelmed all the time, a little bit more anxious all the time, because meditation is like, is like installing a volume knob for your thoughts to be able to tune them up and down. And we only get that by embracing the stillness, by embracing our breath, by moving closer to the center of our being by switching from the having mode to the being mode. That's really what meditation is all about. And it's about using our breath to get more present. It's not about controlling the situation. It's not about controlling our thoughts. It's about letting them flow through us and not getting attached to one or many that come through just saying, these are the thoughts, these things are passing through. And this is who I am in the present moment, embracing that stillness, embracing that quiet so that we can utilize that breath in real time situations when we need to control our response or have that pause after a hard stimulus or think about how we can overcome this next challenge or that obstacles make us stronger. The breathing and meditation, the combination of the two is your life force and there may not be a better resource that's free and available to all of us all the time. So I really encourage you to try to implement that practice into your life as part of your mental fitness toolkit. Draco go. The next practice is reframe thoughts. Reducing anxiety often comes down to fixing negative thought patterns. Understanding some of the distortions in our thinking and reframing it in a more constructive, positive, encouraging, or realistic way. So here's a, a an example situation that some of us might be dealing with um, at work, right? So the situation is a coworker who I'm usually friendly with and would like to be better friends with walks by me and doesn't say hello. Okay, so what might actually happen in that moment is now we have negative thoughts and harsh thoughts that creep into our mind. Things like, what did I do wrong? Is she mad at me? She must not like me. I'm not good enough. I suck. I'm the worst. All right, so those thoughts start to come in. And as we have more negative thoughts come in, they secrete more and more and more and more and more. And we really spiral into something not very good. And so then our feelings become hurt, sad, anxious, overwhelmed, worrisome. And that behavior turns into a spiral of overthinking, a uh, vent to another coworker, or rude towards our partner when we get home. It just creates a cascade of events on something that wasn't even potentially real or that wasn't the actual truth. And so if we can pause and reframe, where does that pause come from? The pause comes from our ability to control our response. How do we control our response? By taking a deep breath and connecting to our life force after an event. Event plus response equals outcome. We always control our response no matter what. And so if we can take that pause, that slight pause after the stimulus, take a deep breath. This might be an alternative approach. Oh, she, she must have had a, a lot going on today. She just didn't, just didn't see me. So what are our feelings arise from that? We're neutral. We're unfazed. We're content. What's our behavior? We continue on with our day, not giving it a second thought and knowing that we're going to say hello and strike up a conversation the next time we see her. So that's what actually could happen. That's an alternative, more positive, more encouraging approach to a very simple situation that all of us are going to run through in whatever domain that we might be in in our lives. And so if we can use those first two practices, which are the breathing and the meditation, if we can work on that inner work, that lonely work and figure out that practice and make it real life applicable to reframing our thoughts. Now we've just stacked multiple habits in our mental fitness toolkit that allow us to reduce our anxiety in real time. 
in real time, which is the most important thing we can have because life happens in the present moment and we have to be able to self-regulate and self-soothe if we want to become, again, the greatest version of ourself in best service of the world. And so that's a very important note there about reframing our thoughts and how breathing exercises and meditation apply to this practice of reframing our thoughts because we have that pause and that pause allows us to breathe to slow everything down and to control our response in the most healthy and productive way possible for us. Extremely important, very valuable. Next one is limiting caffeine. Now, <laughs> before you turn off the episode, right, I'm, I'm not telling you, I am not telling you to stop drink coffee because that would be cruel. I'm not telling you to stop drink coffee because I love coffee. Coffee is a ritual for me. It's, it's like a spiritual practice. It's a habit that I enjoy. That's part of me that makes me feel happy and joyful and fulfilled. So I'm not telling you to take that. I'm not taking that away from you, but it may be aggravating your anxiety. And we have to look at these things very seriously if they are elevating or aggravating our anxiety, because we want to be able to reduce that again, so we can have a love affair with the present moment, not have racing heart rate or uh, scratches in our throat or tightness in our chest all of the time. It's not okay. We need, we can be able to self-regulate in the present moment and caffeine may be aggravating that. And so you have to take an honest look, right? It's this three-step approach of awareness, acceptance, and action. You're aware that something is a little off. You accept the fact that it might be caffeine and then you take action on it by going cold turkey, going cold turkey for just a few days to get a better assessment or impact of caffeine on you. And then you adjust as needed. You understand that there's uh, there's boundaries that you can place on it. There's time restraints. There's limiting number of milligrams of caffeine you can have. There's a bunch of different things you can do, but you have to really uh, be aware of that. You have to accept the fact of how it's elevating or aggravating your anxiety. And you have to act, take the action steps to then improve upon that. So I'm saying, I'm talking about limiting caffeine in these different ways to reduce anxiety because it might be aggravating you and you might be just ignoring that fact because again, you might enjoy it like I do or it's just part of your routine or it's habitual or you're not getting enough sleep, which we'll talk about in another habit moving forward. But you have to seriously look at the caffeine intake and how it's actually affecting you and then move forward from there to adjust as needed. Speaking of sleep, um, the fourth habit we're going to talk about is this one, is fix your sleep patterns, fix your sleep habits. Very, very important. It is not normal. Again, it is not normal to feel tired and stressed at 4 p.m. every day. I say this quote a lot, but I'm going to say it again. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. That means just because if everyone else is tired and stressed at 4 p.m. doesn't mean you should be too. You can be different than that. And that's about really dialing in our caffeine intake, reframing of our thoughts, our breathing and our meditation, but it really boils down to fixing our sleep habits. What are the four fundamentals of being a human being? Eating well, moving well, sleeping well, and thinking well. The foundational, foundational, foundational piece is sleep. Sleep gives us the energy, the clarity of mind, the focus, the willpower to do all those other things great. If we want to fucking go out every day and crush it and to the edge of our capacity, get to the messy edge, as Dr. Michael Gervais says, then we have to prioritize our sleep. The best performers in the whole world, the best performers in the whole world sleep eight hours and 36 minutes every night on average. They're almost sleeping nine hours a day. So we must do that too. We must make that a priority. We must make that our number one self-care strategy is fixing our sleep because quality sleep is the foundation of good health, of good mental health, of good overall well-being, and it has to be a priority. So getting sleep right, according to Andrew Huberman, is about one, getting sunlight exposure within 30 minutes of waking up because that regulates your circadian rhythms, right? Two, you want to avoid bright light of all colors between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Number four, you want to, or number three, sorry, you want to keep your room very cool. You want to keep your room as dark as possible, 
no caffeine post 2 p.m. So that's another thing that we're, there's a confluence of wellness factors here that all stack and add on to each other. And that's why you can do these things because these habits stack. And it's very important because it makes it just a little easier to accomplish and do because you can do all of these things sort of together, right? For example, if you go for a walk out in nature, you can take mindful breaths. You're moving your body and you're out in nature through three very important habits for improving your life, which I talked about in episode 228, if you want to refer to that, because this is episode 230. No caffeine post 2 p.m. And uh, the last one being limiting or no alcohol. So those are some of the important movers, the big rocks to get into the container when we're thinking about our sleep, but we have to prioritize it. There's really no other option. If you're very serious about you know, reducing your anxiety and, and prioritizing your mental health and becoming the best version of you in greatest service of the world. Sleep is one of the number one factors we can focus on eating well, moving well, sleeping well, thinking well, boom, you got this. Next one is journaling. I love journaling. Journaling's awesome. If you have too many thoughts in your head, get them out literally by journaling. Journaling is a forcing function. You have a lot going on. You're feeling a lot of things. You're feeling anxious. You're worried about the past. You're worried about the present. You're worried about the future. You're just worried. Get them out on a sheet of paper. It's a forcing function. Allow yourself to see what you're actually thinking. And then you can make more logical decisions based on actually being able to visualize and see and grasp what you're thinking. One of the best anxiety antidotes I've ever discovered is simply dumping my thoughts onto a sheet of paper or onto an app, right? There's plenty of things to do it. I like physically writing things down. These are the best pens, by the way. I like physically writing things down because it helps me to just feel what I'm doing. It helps me to visualize the thoughts that are coming out of my head. And again, it's a forcing function. Journaling is a great thing to uh, partner with your breathing or meditation, right? It's a good thing to do before, right when you wake up or right before you go to bed. It's good to do whenever, but we want to be able to make these habits too small to fail. And we also want to anchor them to previous behaviors. And so if you, if you've discovered and found that you love the breathing or the meditation exercises, wow, that you've implemented into your life, then why not add a little journaling to it? And I really like to put the date on my journals, especially when I make an important entry, because whatever I was maybe worrying about or thinking about, I look at it two days, three days, a week, four weeks, six months from now, and I can see that my perspective changed. The thing that I was worried about, uh, well, I'm not worried about anymore. The thing that was a problem is not a problem anymore. It just gives me a an absolute checklist of things that I've overcome in my life. It gives me proof that I can overcome obstacles, that I can overcome challenges. And most of our problems, most of our problems can be solved by, you know, a walk out in nature and a good night's sleep because we have more perspective, more clarity of mind, more energy to go out the day and do the thing that we know we need to do. And so journaling again is another huge mover when it comes to reducing our anxiety. Another huge thing that we can put into our mental fitness toolkit. Uh, next one here is huge. We all know how huge this is, but I'm going to keep reinforcing this fact that the next one or this one currently number six is practice gratitude, practice gratitude. So much anxiety stems from a feeling that something is missing in our lives. When I get whatever, I'll be happy. When I get this, I'll be happy. Gratitude allows us to cherish what we already have in this life. Like removing the need to always seek more, but being so good with what we do have, with the relationships we do have, with the, you know, whatever, whatever it is in your life, I can't specifically speak to your experience, but I know that gratitude increases joy, increases happiness, increases fulfillment because we are content 
with what we do have. It doesn't mean we are complacent. If we are grateful for what we do have, it doesn't mean we can't strive to become more. We're not striving to have more. We're striving to become more, more virtuous, more value-driven, more living through our personal philosophy, aligning our words and actions. Those are how we become more, more disciplined, right? More kind, more honest, more respectful. That's becoming more, not having more. Because if everything got stripped away in your life right now, what would be left? The only things that would be left were the things that you're truly, truly grateful for. So make this practice of gratitude potentially part of your journaling practice. Again, now you're stacking habits together to allow you to really build this mental fitness toolkit that is going to enhance your life for the rest of your days. So practice gratitude. Try it out. What are three things right now? Three things. Think of them right now that you're grateful for, that you're so fucking grateful for. Me, it's my health. Two, it's my fiance. And three is my parents. Those three things every day I'm so fucking grateful for. I'm so grateful to be able to wake up, to do what I do, to have this body, this mind, this soul. I'm so grateful that my fiance came into my life. She's made it better from the second that I met her. And I'm so lucky, so lucky, beyond lucky, beyond lucky to have the parents that I have. And I'm grateful for that every single day of my life. What are you grateful for? Tell me. As Naval says, Desire is a contract that you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. Let me read that again. Naval said this, desire is a contract that you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. Value what you have while you have it. And the last one, number seven, is daily movement, right? In the sleeping portion of this uh, episode, I talked about eating well, moving well, sleeping well, and thinking well. Well, daily movement has to be a part of your mental fitness toolkit, and it's one of the best ways to reduce anxiety. And this is not really like going to the gym, but this is like being able to go for a walk. Because going for a walk allows you to connect with nature, like I said, allows you to start breathing mindfully and allows you to just gain peace of mind, which is extremely helpful when trying to reduce anxiety. But uh, another really good movement practice for reducing anxiety is yoga. It's an embodied technique. There's so much breathing and movement involved in a yogic practice that it's super powerful. So if you haven't implemented that as part of your routine, I would implement that too, right? Because there's another thing that you can stack together as you're breathing, your meditation and your yoga practice all in one, your gratitude and your journaling practice all in one. All of these things are built better through prioritizing our sleep. And then we'll have the ability, the mental clarity, the response techniques to reframe our thoughts. So really all of these habits go together. There are things that you can do every single day to start reducing your anxiety, to control your thoughts, to have a better, more fulfilling, more present filled life. Because the goal, right? The goal is to have a love affair with the present moment. And so those are just seven simple ways that we can start to reduce our anxiety. Again, I would refer to episode 228 about those nine habits that are gonna improve your life and then really refer to episodes 218 and 220 to build the foundation of target setting and behavior change so we can actually implement all of these tools one at a time, very small, too small to fail, then moving from there. Not rushing to get all of these done within two weeks, but giving ourselves a long period of time, 12 months to 36 months to implement all of these things and see where our life could be in two years and three years and four years, not in two days. Because we can do that. We have the ability to see long term, to gain perspective, to know that we're going to commit to that. We're going to commit to these habits and goals and changing our life for the better so we can become the greatest version of ourselves in greatest service of the world over the next lifetime because this is an ever evolving process, a constantly evolving process. You're constantly evolving. And so our habits are constantly evolving and you just grow and evolve and change with life. And that's beautiful. That process is beautiful. You're worth the time, the attention, the energy you're going to give it. You're worth it. You're valuable. You're important. The world needs everything that you have to offer. And I love you so much. Thank you for being here. And I'll see you guys next time. Cheers. If you enjoyed that episode, please click here for another full length episode of the podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe. But above all else, above all else, most importantly, please, please take good care of yourselves 
and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.